Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope you got some coffee, you got all hopped up, because this is not going to be exciting. I mean, it is going to be exciting. So we're here to talk about automotive grade Linux, uh, what happened in our, you know, what's been going on recently, and what we did to upgrade to Yocto 5.0. So uh, there's two of us presenting. Uh, I'm Walt. Uh, I've been the AGL automotive grade Linux community manager. I celebrated my 10th anniversary at the Linux Foundation last month, uh, which is unbelievable to me. Um, and you can see kind of where I've been, what I've done. Most of you know me already. Um, and if you really, you know, if you really want to get me interested in talking about something after the presentation, you can ask about my motorcycle or motorcycle trips to California and Canada or wherever else. And I'll let uh, Scott introduce himself. Uh, I'm not sure I could follow up on the motorcycle trips, but uh, so I'm Scott Murray. Uh, I probably recognize a lot of faces in the audience, so p people probably know me to some degree. Uh, Long-term uh, Linux user. I've been doing embedded Linux since pretty much 2000. Uh, I've been working at Consulco Group as a principal software engineer since 2014, and I've uh, been working on AGL on contracts since 2016. Uh, so not, you know, don't quite have the 10 years that Walt does. Um, and, you know, my work on uh, AGL has been uh, a lot of the Octo project maintenance uh, and, and, you know, the last five or six years, uh, a lot of the demo development and integration and maintenance, which does come into, you know, a lot of the Octo related things. Oh, yeah, if you want it. And if you want to talk to Scott afterwards, you can talk to him about beer or whiskey and he'll gladly talk all day. <laughs> Okay, so I was going to do a, I'm assuming most everybody here knows what automotive grade Linux is, so I'm going to just go over this quickly. Then we can get to Scott's part about Yocto, and then we can go back to AGL later. So we're a nonprofit organization. We're hosted by the Linux Foundation. We're collaborating uh, with about nine o different OEMs uh, to, and a large number of automotive tier ones to uh, build the car of the future. Um, OEMs include most of the ecosystem in Japan, Toyota, Mazda, Nissan, uh, Honda, um, and as well as Suzuki and a few others. And then we have Mercedes in, and VW in Europe and SAIC in China. People ask me all the time, so where is AGL you know, now? It's in your Toyota vehicles and your Lexus vehicles, uh, some Subarus and uh, some Mercedes Benz Vanses. Vanses, nice. <laughs> <laughs> the AGL Unified Code Base. So see, that was as quick of an introduction to AGL as you're ever gonna get. The AGL Unified Code Base. So uh, we started this probably in 2015. Um, and the idea is that we're taking the best of open source software and marrying that to uh, automotive automotive developers, I don't know why that flipped, automotive developers, and uh, reduce, trying to reduce fragmentation in the automotive industry. We are completely open source and transparent. Everything that you see today that we, we have, um, I have a bunch of links at the bot at the, end, at the end of the slide deck. All the code, all the wiki pages, all the documentation, everything is completely open. And uh, basically it's fully customizable. We support Flutter apps, we support Qt apps, um, and it's supported by tier ones and service providers like Scott and like Calabra. George, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, I don't know. So he'll be talking after this talk about what the recent develops in developments in Pipewire and Wireplumber and a lot of that fed directly into AGL as well. Um, a lot of people have this notion or this idea that AGL is only about IVI in vehicle infotainment. In fact, uh, we have multiple instrument cluster configurations that are being built by our instrument cluster expert group. Those instrument cluster uh, images include a, a flutter, flutter images, cute images. Some of them run on bare metal Linux, some of them run in a container, and some of them run on KVM or hypervisor. So there's a lot of different options, both for your instrument cluster or your IVI system. Again, Flutter, Qt, uh, hypervisor, container, or straight, straight Linux. And then earlier this year, uh, Scott, led by Scott, 
um, and Jan Simon, our release manager, our connectivity expert group created a, a gateway device profile or a telematics device profile. And we showed that at Embedded World in, Linux, in uh, Nuremberg back in April. And you can see that this, this had uh, some, what we call our demo control panel, which is a, a little Raspberry Pi 5 device hooked up to a, a touch screen where you can simulate inputs into the vehicle. I know why this is changing. This, this particular one I'm reusing from a deck that auto-rotated. <laughs> um, so we're simulating, we're simulating inputs that go in via two different CAN buses, and that, that data is being aggregated by this gateway. The gateway then sends it up to the cloud via MQTT and sends it over via Ethernet to our IVI and instrument cluster. So uh, we had two different boards. We had this one running uh, virtual machines. We had this one running the gateway. Uh, probably four different Linux instances running on different boards. Uh, and each of these were running our new Flutter uh, our new Flutter UI that's been, the Flutter Embedder has been worked on by Toyota and they continue to upgrade and support that, that Embedder. Um, I like this slide, Some, I think Dan Kaushi made this slide, they called it the AGL Aquarium. So <clears throat> if you're familiar with AGL, we name our, our releases after fish. Um, we've done two major releases a year. We support those releases with patch upgrades. So Scott will talk a little bit about our Yocto patch up, our, our, our process for, for doing patch updates based on the Yocto LTS. Um, earlier this year, we released uh, Quirky Quillback, which was version 17. That was released back in February. Um, we had basically, in, at that time frame, we had a brand new UI developed uh, pretty quickly by ICS and by Scott and integrated into our, our famous green machine demo that you may have seen at other, at other trade shows. Um, and all, basically all the reference apps were converted to this really nice new UI that ICS developed for us from a, a blank sheet of paper. We now have Amazon, Graviton, AWS support so you can spin up an AGL instance in the cloud. And we added a RISC-V architecture earlier this year as well. And then in July, we added to the aquarium a, uh, a royal rice fish. He wears the AGL crown proudly. You can see. Uh, that was released on July 12th. And so that's really the, what we're going to talk about today, for the most part, is our upgrade to Yocto 5.0 or Scarth Gap. Um, that's the new Yocto LTS. We also did the latest upgrade, uh, an upgrade to the latest version of Flutter, which that Toyota supported, which at the time was 3.19.3. The IVI home screen for Flutter was updated even further. And uh, Scott did a lot of updates to kuxa.val and the gateway demo image was added into our, into our, our images as well. And finally, uh, the Raspberry Pi 5 is now supported. So, with that, Scott will talk about the uh, road to Scarth Gap. Sure, thank you. Or the bike ride to Scarth Gap, if you're Richard <laughs> Purdy. <laughs> That's going to be topical in a second. Uh, so, you know, whilst, you know, kind of giving you this is, you know, Rice Flish was the release where we, you know, pushed out Scarth Gap support. Uh, but so, you know, AGL, we've been tracking uh, the Octo Project LTSs since they started with Dunfell. Uh, and so basically that was supported up until April. So basically we supported that for the four years. And then, you know, we still have a Kirkstone release, which is going to go for two more years, um, which I believe is Pike is the, the release that's going to continue or uh, Quillback is going to be the one that's, <laughs> I did present this before, so um, it's rusty. All right. So we're going to keep going until, you know, 2026 on that release. Uh, but, you know, we do have this new Scarth Gap release that just came out. Uh, so, you know, that came out at the end of April. Um, and so that's going to go for four more years. Uh, and so it's interesting uh, to note that both Dunfell and Kirkstone, when they released, it was officially, the story was they're going to be supported for two years LTS. But both of them, as the you know, end of the second year approach, they were extended two more years. With, you know, there was discussion happened inside the, you know, Yocto advisory board and the steering committee. But this time it was official from the get-go. This is a four-year LTS. 
Uh, and so that you know, overlaps Kirkstone, of course, the same way that the Dunfell and Kirkstone did. Uh, and we're going to keep tracking, like you know, I mentioned, that uh, we'll keep going with Kirkstone. And you know, those updates at this point, when there's a new you know, Kirkstone branch release on Yocto, those aren't big updates at this point. It's just you know, security fixes for the most part. Uh, so what is this SCARF gap? Thank thankfully, Wikipedia has a picture. <laughs> uh, if you look, you know, Google uh, Scarf Gap, you do find this page on Wikipedia. And so this is one of those uh, basically uh, mountain trails that Richard Purdy, the uh, uh, Yocto maintainer, likes to sort of spend his free time on uh, mountain biking. Uh, so, you know, the, we said this is it. How is our road to Scarf Gap? How did this worked out? So, and we merged are the scarf gap support um, just before the milestone run release for the rice fish uh, you know branch final like sort of stretch of release cycle uh, and that was at the end of April and so that was actually before uh, the Octo project officially tagged and released um, upstream and so how, how we were how we were ahead enough to actually do this um, so in AGL, we have what we call the next branch. Uh, and so how that sort of came about was usually, you know, back in the beginning, like eight or nine years ago, every Yocta release, AGL would basically do a branch. We do the work to, you know, get AGL sort of ported to the new release of Yocto, and then we would merge that and we'd throw that branch away. And so when the LTS releases of Yocto came along, it started to be the case that we decided we were gonna basically stick to the cadence of the LTSs upstream, and we weren't gonna up, update to the interim Yocta releases. But, um, as I'll say, show in the next slide, you know, it's problematic to sort of just start at, you know, when the LTS release comes out, start the porting process then. Uh, so after Yocta Project Dunfell came out in 2020, we started a next branch to sort of keep going and sort of prepare for, you know, we knew another LTS was coming. So, you know, the, the eventual what became Kirkston. And so why would we do this? Um, so there's sort of three things. Uh, one is to spread the development across the two year cycle basically, and not do that like rushed big banning integration, you know, either just before upstream release the next LTS or afterwards. Uh, because it's stressful, basically, to do that kind of work. And sometimes it doesn't align well with things like trade shows and stuff. Uh, you, you basically, it causes a lot of, of unnecessary stress. Um, and so if we spread that over the couple of years, then we avoid that. Um, as well, at this point, the uh, Meta AGL, uh, we have our layer tested by the Octo Project Auto Builder upstream. And so we pretty much have to keep a branch that's always buildable by the, the auto builder um, or else we get people yelling at us. Um, and so the next branch is how we do that. Um, as well, you know, having this active branch where we're tracking what's going on upstream, if upstream makes a change that we then see doesn't necessarily work for us or, you know, maybe it's a thing that we look, oh, this is a new feature we could take advantage of it's good to actually be keeping up with the upstream development and sort of catch these things early or see a change and say, well, we, our next release, we could plan to use that. Um, so how do we actually do this? So basically the master branch or main branch of AGL development, we have this branch and you know, the next branch is forked off of that. And as we go along in the, the, you know, the two years in between LTS releases, we're basically refreshing the next branch with new changes that are gone into AGL master. So we do that by rebasing. Um, and so, you know, the goal is to have it reasonably up to date, but you know, there's only a couple of us that do that most of the time. So it's like right now, I think it's like three or four weeks behind. Um, and so, you know, probably either during the week while I'm sitting in the talk or, you know, next week I'll do a rebase and try and get everything working again. Um, and so, those rebases basically are, to some degree, allow us when we get to the end of the two years and we actually pull this stuff into our master branch, keep the Git history relatively clean. Because sometimes we would do a whole bunch of small changes and then squash them. Because otherwise, in we use Garrett for uh, review. You don't want to have like 
a hundred small little changes, that, you know, change this one variable to work with, you know, some interim yacht to release. It's pretty messy to kind of get that all pushed through. So try and keep our history clean and make the review easy when we do actually merge. Um, and the other sort of th key thing to note is we support quite a few platforms in AGL, and we're doing this next branch sort of cycle. Uh, we really only test the QMU machines. It's not like 100%. Sometimes I'll test things like Raspberry Pi or a few other BSPs that I know are relatively good at tracking and, and like keeping up to date with master. Uh, but it's, you know, easy to test QMU. So that's what the focus is. Um, as well, we do have to sort of do things like where all of our, like all of our layers have an X branch and the repo manifest, we have a repo, uh, like a manifest that points to those. But then we have things like our compositor, a couple other small uh, EGL components that we have next branches to carry changes. So for the compositor, it's basically to track Weston changes. Uh, Weston's API changes over time. And uh, we have a, a gentleman from Collabra that does our compositor work. He will you know, basically keep it up to date as we're going through our you know, in-between LTS releases. Um, and so we do also have some provision for in our CI, when someone you know, makes a change and it does get merged into master branch, there's a task to try and actually rebase the next branch automatically. Um, and so I have a little bit more to say about that, but right now the thing to know is that doesn't always work because you're going to have merge conflicts um, or rebase uh, conflicts, but it doesn't gate whether the CI for their change allows it to go into master or not. It's basically a follow-on task. And Yen Simone and I get mail telling us that you know things are need to be looked at. Um, so that's sort of the process um, for rice fish. You know how next branch sort of ended up uh, getting merged in. Uh, basically, they did the last rebase to get caught up to just you know the last milestone of you know the the uh, scarf gap release, and did that just before embedded world, and then we merged that in, in the last week of April. And so this is pretty much two years of work by myself, uh, Marius Flad from Calabra, um, did our compositor stuff, Ian Simone as well from, that works on AGL, and uh, one of my colleagues, Dennis, uh, basically helped out in that two-year period a couple times. So that's you know, how we basically do this, and that may, we've already started. I mean, I already have our next branch uh, switched over to the next geoc to release Diehead. And as things go along, there's a couple more releases, and then you know the same process will repeat in you know two years, pretty much. Um, so, what does Scarf got bias in AGL? Um, and this won't be news to some of the folks I see in the audience, but so unlike Kirkstone, there was no massive you know variable renaming happening in Bitbake, and no syntax changes like the uh, appends uh, sort of you know underscore to colon change. Um, and no real like significant variable stuff. So the one thing I tracked down was serial console sort of got more deprecated in uh, Scarthcat. So now the serial consoles is the replacement. Um, the other thing that you know is if you were just doing an upgrade and skipping from Kirkstone to Scarthcat that might trip you is some of the QA checks are now actually errors. Um, things like the patch fuzz checking and uh, upstream status and patches. Um, and the host requirements are, of course, higher. They're listed there. The Python one is probably the biggest one where if you're using a really old, like uh, Ubuntu LTS or Debian, uh, that, that Python will, might be too old now and you'll have to upgrade. Um, and, and in that vein, there's some of the Linux distros aren't supported anymore. Um, I, I'm a Fedora user, so I tend to stay bleeding edge, but like older Fedoras aren't supported anymore. And a Debian less than 11 is probably a thing that would catch at some people that might have older Debians. Um, and so there's some notes there as well about Ubuntu. Um, 1804 is, uh, in a bit of, it's still kind of supported, but I wouldn't count on that lasting forever. Um, and then there's some things around uh, G GCC 14 support on the host. Um, so Fedora 40 is an example of that where right around the time the scarf cap released, there were some rough edges there where you couldn't actually always guarantee that a build that had OE core plus other layers or you know Pocky plus other layers that all the bits would build with a GCC 14 based 
post system. Uh, and that's, there's been a bunch of fixes gone in from a couple people uh, which have been in the Scarth Gap point releases. And so right now that's in, I think, a pretty good shape actually. So um, some other things that came in with Scarth Gap, uh, binary package feed support, which is a, a thing that we have interest in in AGL. Um, there's still some work to be done there. There were uh, some changes, and I believe uh, Michael's given a talk about some of the stuff he did for Scarf Gap, I think tomorrow, maybe. Um, and so we'll probably, in the next couple of years before the next LTS, we're going to do more work, I think, on AGL side to try and actually do some you know, proof prototyping stuff in AGL of, of setting this up. Um, CVE checking is improved, uh, though, you know, going from Kirkstone to Scarth Gap, there's, you know, significant changes there, but right now CV checking in general is a bit shaky the, due to some of the NVD database issues. Uh, and some of the work that's going into Yocto master branch, my expectation is it'll get backported to Scarth Gap to sort of clean that up and make it more robust. So right now I would say, you know, we're still in a little bit of a period of things being unstable there. Um, SD, SPDX, the 2.0 support is in Scarf Gap, and I haven't heard anything definitive, but I wouldn't be too shocked if SPDX 3.0 got backported at some point. Uh, so, some of that stuff got, you know, I think some of the 2.0 support got backported to Kirkstone, I think, maybe. So I think the same thing will happen as well for Scarf Gap. Uh, and I'll try and go a little quick on these ones. Uh, so, you know, for us, you know, you see like, for our downstream people who are going to take AGL and use it for stuff, you know, this tool chain changes that they might be interested in, you know, significantly newer GCC and LLVM. The glibc update, I think, wasn't too dramatic this time. Um, Go, yeah, that's a reasonable upgrade for them. And uh, same, same with Clang, actually. Um, Rust is, gets a little more of a call out. We have started using a few projects that use Rust to build. Um, and so there's a pretty big jump, 1.59 to 1.75, basically from Kirkstone to, uh, to Scarthcap. And we had actually been using 1.75. I basically created a mix-in layer for Kirkstone to provide newer Rust because some, like one of the projects that we use, the Cookstone.val data broker, got to the point it would not build with anything older than one, well, at one point it was 1.72 and then it's basically 1.75 now. Um, and yeah, so the, it's a generic Rust ecosystem thing where it, it isn't necessarily your direct dependencies, but your like sort of transitive or like second or third order dependencies might actually force you to need a newer Rust. Um, and so sooner or later, I suspect, I have mentioned it in some of the Octo calls, it's likely I'm going to make a mix and layer for Scarth Gap because it's already several releases of Rust behind uh, Yocto Master. So this is something to be aware of if you're, you know, doing some Rust development and using, you know, Yocto project. Uh, as well, it kind of in impacted us more maybe than some people who use uh, vendor BSP layers. Uh, the Linux Yocto uh, got the pretty big jump from 5.15 to 6.6. And so our QMU uh, builds use that kernel. Uh, and actually for native x86, we reused the QMU build through some few tweaks. So you know, basically that's a pretty big kernel jump for that. And you know, of course need a bunch of testing. We're using the new generic ARM machine. Um, and we haven't fully vetted system ready 2.0 support, but it's sort of a, an ongoing thing. I think we're gonna try and make a, you know, a full build for that at some point where we say officially here's a system ready image for AGL. Uh, and Walt mentioned this AWS uh, targets now. Uh, we also have our own little machine definition for running inside KVM, um, which is, you know, basically a lightly uh, tweaked uh, QMU, basically, uh, bas basically to turn on some extra vert IO bits. Uh, and I'll skip over this one to give us more time. So basically, there's a bunch of other things updated, probably there, the big ones on the graphics side are the Meza, um, and you know, we use systemd, so the systemd uh, Upgrade gives us a few more tools in the toy box, basically, to play with like, some of the fancier system B features, um, which are mentioned here. But the, the first bullet here is the separate USR. So we had actually been using user merge in AGL for, I think, since Kirkstone started, basically. Um, so we were ahead of the, the curve on that. So that wasn't a big deal for us. 
Um, there's a bunch of T TPM support stuff in newer SystemD, and that's a thing we need to sort of push to some of our members to try and sort of proof that. And, cause, and we have folks talking about developing some App Store stuff on top of AGL, and this starts to become very interesting of going right from TPMs into containers and stuff like that. So there's uh, other presentations, I think, this week about those kinds of things. So this is the kind of stuff we want to actually have latest tools to support. Um, the system extension feature, which I'm not sure how many people read uh, Lenart's uh, systemd blog post, but it's a pretty interesting feature where basically you can do uh, file system overlays of your root file system and systemd automatically will apply them on boot and stuff like that. So we haven't coded up trying anything that, with that yet, but it's on my to-do list to try and like show like live system updates and things like that. So uh, QMU, like I said, we're Active QMU users, the Virtio Sound device is a new feature. Uh, there's now a generic uh, vhost user device, which allows you to sort of more easily do development of new Virtio uh, devices. Um, and so that was, I haven't used it yet. I think I have a use case for that. I'll try and put up soon. Uh, and, and basically, in general, Virtio support, the, going from QMU 6 to 8 is a pretty big jump. And, you know, basically all the BSP layers, basically by going to their Scarf branch, we got a lot of, uh, of upgrades. Most of them go to a 6.6 kernel, which is nice to get us sort of, you know, well out of the 5.0s, except for uh, the Renaissance. <laughs> the Renaissance BSP, basically we're still on a 5.10 kernel. Um, and one notable thing, if you're an NXP user, uh, they still don't have a Weston 13 uh, recipe in their layers, which, impacts us a bit. Um, it's still a little bit of an unsolved issue. We might end up having to support Weston 12 for them. So uh, so that's sort of the state of, you know, how we got to Scarf Gap, what it brought, and now where we go next. Uh, so we've already pulled in some of the point releases. Uh, 5.03 is already in the, the Rice Fish 1801 release from last week. Um, and of course, it's, you know, there's more you know, 5.0 releases on the six week cycle. Uh, we'll be pulling those in and pushing those out as updates. Um, and so we basically do that for LTS branches. So Quillback does that for Kirkstone. Almost every six weeks we'll have a release. Um, and so that's, you know, if you're interested in seeing somebody do this as a process, we do have that because an ongoing thing. Um, and like I mentioned, I already have the next branch sort of started as, you know, post Scarf Gap. Uh, and it was somewhat forced. Um, there, the unpacker change that's going into Styhead uh, for Yocto is uh, basically to keep the auto builder working. I had to already sort of make those changes. Uh, and that those actually at the moment uh, we've had to disable some of our CI automatic rebasing because the unpacker changes are somewhat widespread. And so it's it's I have some thoughts on how I can maybe kind of make that work better, but. Uh, there are, there's a good chance we might have to not do our automatic rebasing and do a bit more manual work for the next couple of years. And there we go. That's the end of my content. I think Walt has a few more slides past this point, uh, if we have time. Do we have time? <laughs> it's, yeah, I think so. There's 10 minutes left. Wow. 12. Okay. So, um, yeah, just a couple, just a couple comments. So, uh, in terms of collaboration, we're a very collaborative project. Um, AGL is invested in, in automotive software components that are not available anywhere else, um, including you know some of the reference apps that we have, and uh, we continually we're continually uh, continually evaluating open source technologies, uh, and you can see some of that in what Scott just said to provide the best in class for automotive use cases, and we've invested heavily. Uh, by providing developers or upstream code to open source projects such as Pipewire, Yocto, Lava, and others. And uh, the next talk, George will talk about uh, some of the Pipewire stuff. And we're willing to collaborate with anybody who brings code. I think generally speaking, we're a pretty easy community to get along with. Um, if you've got something, if you've got a recipe, you can submit it to Garrett. We'll help you get it into our code base. Um, we're pretty, pretty willing to work with anybody. Uh, we have a number of um, expert groups that meet every two weeks. I have a weekly, 
on Thursday mornings, uh, Eastern Time US. I have a weekly developer call. Anybody can call in, they can, uh, they can ask questions, they can get help. Um, I provide no help, but the other people do. Um, and I think, I think for the, mo the most important thing for our purposes is that uh, we have a, an open source, pro an open source uh, program office expert group that's going to be starting. Um, tomorrow afternoon at about this time, there's a, maybe a little earlier, there's a panel discussion uh, being led by Endosan from Toyota. He and Ido-san from Toyota are going to be leading the open source expert group, the OSPO expert group. Um, we really would like to see anybody from the automotive community, uh, whether it's tier one, OEM, tier two, join us, encourage participate. We're trying to encourage participation in open source communities by automotive companies. If you've, if you've worked in the automotive industry at all in open source, you'll know that you know, getting approval within a, an automotive company to even upstream a, a, simple, a fairly simple patch can be very difficult because there's just this misunderstanding of, of what open, stream, open source is and what it all means. So we really want to kind of share um, knowledge among the automotive companies. There are some companies that have done a really good job of you know, making their developers available and you know, letting them upstream code in areas that are, that are important and maybe you know, usually non-differentiating. Uh, the charter for the OSPO expert group is nearly complete. We've been working on it. Um, we're going to basically announce the charter, I think, at Automotive Linux Summit slash Open Source Summit Japan at the end of October. And we'll begin by bi weekly meetings uh, in November. Um, I'll skip. So, again, these slides are already uploaded to SCED, the, the, the meeting thing. <clears throat> we have a confluence page with links to all the expert groups so you can see what they're doing, what they're working on. Uh, some important expert groups that meet, every, meet uh, are, are, you know, the SDV expert group, Software Defined Vehicle Expert Group, meets every other Tuesday. Uh, like I said, we have a weekly developer call. We have a mailing list. And in the last month or so, we started a Discord server because that's what all the cool kids do. They're on Discord now. <laughs> so uh, we want to be one of the cool kids because the cool kids don't like IRC anymore for some reason. I know it's painful, but we're still on IRC. We're still there. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Um, and then just some more, some more links to all of our stuff. Um, and that'll leave us with a few minutes, maybe five minutes for some questions. Yeah, Chuck. What is, I, I know you don't speak for any, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't know. What is the opinion in general about how much we should include in the required set of host tools? I know uh, if you build Java, it requires seven levels of bootstrap and hell. <laughs> there and there's like, no one wants to maintain it. And there's some pure functional language, I'm forgetting the name. Like, if you want to do shell check, it requires 18 levels of hell to get bootstrap. And, like maybe we just solve that by adding more to the host tools. What's, what's the, what's the I'm gonna let Scott jump in on that one. <laughs> I, it's too bad I can't defer to Ian Simone. Um, yeah, I'm Simon, you wanna uh, come up here uh, and help? <laughs> uh, so in general, I'm not a big fan of just arbitrarily adding more host tools because it makes your build harder to make reproducible. Right. Um, Cause you're removing, it, like, you then have a separate thing to document and maintain and stuff outside of, you know, you know, a Yocto project or whatever other, you know, comprehensive tooling you're using. Um, but I mean, it is what it is, right? If you know, if uh, you, you go to a tier one, you buy something and it is Java based or some other thing or in house you develop with, you know, the, the latest new cool functional language, you have to make it work. Um, but like, we don't support anything as an example upstream. Um, there are I think there are a couple of the BSP layers that play with host tools, um, which I'm not a huge fan of either, but um, because, you know, some of it is, a, there's a transparency issue a little bit, right? And if you have a good team and you document all the things and have a, you know, a process that's workable, but in open source, when you're trying to say, here's how you build our project, the more steps you put in for require that kind of stuff, 
Uh, and we see this a little bit, I think, with the Flutter right now. Some of the uh, stuff for doing Flutter development is a bit invasive on what it wants to put on your host system, um, especially for the Toyota and Better setup. And we're, it, that's recognized as a thing, and, and the Toyota guys are actively like like working to improve that. Um, but it, you know, it's like I said, it is what it, what it is sometimes. But anybody else? Oh, way Tim? back, way back there. Question was, are we doing anything about boot time? And the short answer is no. <laughs> that's, that's one of those differentiators that people don't <laughs> the, the, I mean, the basic problem is, you know, we, we're relying on, on basically eval boards from the board vendors. And more and more, it's becoming difficult for us to get those, th those, those boards. So e the, the NXP IMX9, for example, we'd love to get that board in, and we'd love to work on boot time on it. Um, it's under NDA, and I can't sign, you know, Linux Foundation, I can't sign an NDA, so I can't even buy the board. So really, we're, you know, there's really no, not a lot of point in working on boot time and Kimu, it's not going to be very yeah. applicable. Um, yeah. the, the last serious discussion around that was for some of the Renaissance hardware, and that was also the blocker on that was the NDAs, basically, so. And we do have, a, to some degree, the members' uh, security and boot time are, are, are what, a couple of the things where they're like, we'll do it in-house. We have teams. So they're less concerned about doing it in open source, unfortunately. I think there'd be a lot of benefit to having some turnkey demos, but so far we haven't managed to convince people to let us do it. So, Any other questions? Way in the back. I didn't catch all on that. So he, I, I think what I heard was, what are we doing about Rust and Scarthgap? Because Rust, because Scarthgap is only supporting Rust through P Pocky. Yes. So the mix is, I mean, so what Scott was saying is, yeah, right today it's fine. But you know we're going to be supporting this. We're going to be supporting Scarth Gap for the next two years, yeah. and the, the feeling that we you know that we get is that we're going to have to advance to a later version of Rust sometime in the next two years it, it, and have to do a new Scarth. It's have basically to do a new guaranteed layer. that we will have to have a newer version of Rust um, because we the data broker we get from uh, Bosch and Etas, uh, which is an open source project. They have other developers, but all it takes is them. Not even them changing their PubSpec YAML in the pro, pro, sorry the uh, cargo uh, TOML file, it could be four levels down. Someone changes something, and all of a sudden it needs latest Rust, and it's really hard to work around that with cargo. Actually, you end up having to fork half of the pro, like half of the modules we're using to avoid some of this stuff, which we don't want to do. We don't want to be in the process of maintaining a whole bunch of forked Rust modules, um, and so it's. You know, it's not that bad. Um, it's not like completely trivial, but it's not that bad to make the mix and layer to actually have newer Rust. Um, it's on my to-do list because uh, Yocto Masters, I think 1.80 is either in or already going in soon. Uh, and so it, it's already a couple releases ahead of Scarf Gap. And so I can make a meta Scarf Gap or a, a meta LTS mix-ins uh, Scarf Gap dash rust uh, mix in layer it's just i haven't had a chance to sort of proof it yet and it should be easier to maintain the kirkstone there's some funkiness where a bunch of the db class stuff for the rust build is different it changed in uh Mikledor, i think and so there was a little harder backports for that it'll be easier for scarf gap so it's doable hopefully that answered we your have, question we have one minute left any other questions Right, but you're, you're consuming someone's project, and if they do a cargo update, <laughs> and their lock file refers to the new thing and you want to build it, you have to then try and regenerate the lock file, and that doesn't always work. Yeah, but it's stable. Shouldn't, shouldn't the 
and it's not stable. So we're, because, yeah. because it only locks that top level and, and people mess up their semantic versioning when they do updates. I can dig through our history and yeah. point out. So, so, so the big one is, uh, that broke recently is the command line processing stuff, CLAP, in the Rust ecosystem. Some of their dependencies all of a sudden force the new, uh, like needing new Rust. One, one thing to keep in mind is that Scarth Gap is an LTS, but AGL keeps moving on. So rice fish, uh, salmon, tuna, I forget what U is, they're all gonna be using Scarth Gap for the next two years. And we're gonna be pulling in new, new updates of Flutter, of the data broker, et cetera, et cetera. And so they may require later versions of Rust. Yeah, so if we were static, yeah, I completely agree with you, but we're not. So if you, want, if you want a really detailed answer to that question, <laughs> you go talk to that guy over there, Jan Simon Muller. He's our continuous integration and automated test lead. Basically, we have, we're using Garrett, like Scott mentioned. We have Jenkins and we have Lava. So every, every uh, commit in, in Garrett gets, uh, smoke, gets tested, validated auto automatically in, with Jenkins. We have a, a whole bunch of tests that we run. Then when, they get, when it gets merged, the same thing happens on the, on the branch. And then we also have a, uh, a guy employed by Consulco uh, who runs a weekly manual testing as well as manual testing on the releases. So it's, we do have quite a bit of testing that goes on uh, within, within the system. And I think we're out of time. So um, that, those were great questions. I don't have a t-shirt like Philip did to give you for the best question. Um, but um, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference.